Have you ever watched a robotic arm reach for a target, or a character in a video game stumble on an uneven surface? These are problems in inverse kinematics, and they can be solved by the Jacobian method. But who is this, Jacobian? While the complexity of the Jacobian method may seem threatening at first, it's not that bad when you take it one step at a time. There's a kind of magic to the technical language described in, a mystique that us mere mortals have no hopes of understanding it. But actually, the Jacobian solver is one of the easier IK solvers to make. One of the main advantages of the Jacobian method is that it does not depend on work of other joints in the joint chain to compute any one joint. It's all independent. But this is also what gives this method numerical instability. It makes it prone to oscillation, is a double-edged sword. What is a Jacobian matrix? Like any other matrix, the Jacobian matrix is a simple grid of numbers or a table. So hold on because actually computing it is going to make it a lot clearer than explaining what it is. Dead meme time. The columns represent joints and the rows represent the grabber. In the Jacobian matrix, changes in joint angles map to changes in position and orientation of the end effector. The Jacobian matrix, which represents the relationship between joint velocities and end effector velocities, consists of partial derivatives where each number represents how a small change in the joint's angles leads to change in the position of the effector. Each element of the Jacobian is a partial derivative that quantifies the relationship of a specific end effector's spatial coordinates with respect to a particular joint's motion. In a 3D space, an end effector has six degrees of freedom. Three for position, x, y, and z, and three for orientation, rotation about x, y, and z, or roll, pitch, and yaw. For instance, a ball and socket joint would typically have three columns in the matrix, each representing the rotation about the x, y, and z axes respectively, while the hinge joint would only have one column representing its rota rotational degree of freedom. Anyway, for the transpose, we just take this and flip it around so that the rows are the joints and the columns are the end effector data. To put this in programmer's terms, we can think of the Jacobian as a struct of arrays and the transpose as an array of structs. So when implementing the solver, we only actually need one of these, the faster one. That would be the transpose. So we don't calculate the Jacobian and take the transpose, we just calculate the transpose directly and use it. And all we do for the transpose solver is multiply the transpose by the difference between where we are and where we want to be. That's all it is. Computing the transpose. So we can basically think of the transpose as an array of values, one for each joint. So computing the transpose is as simple as iterating over each joint and computing a value. So each item in the array is completely independent of every other item. There are no interdependencies in calculating the transpose. So for each axis that the joint can move on, we want to perturb it by a small amount and see how doing that changes the end effector, and record that change. So after that, all that's left to do is abstract the position of the effector without that change and store the delta over the angle change. This is the partial derivative. This is also why the Jacobian is said to be slow because the endpoint needs to be recomputed for each axis and for each joint, and that means going through the whole kinematic chain. But it's not actually. We can reuse a lot of this work. However, we're going to have a lot of problems if the end effect of rotation is important to us. Euler angles can cause gimbal lock, and the nonlinearity quaternions can also cause issues. Either way, it's a bad show. But getting the derivatives of the rotation is the only difficult part. The rest of it is just the same as it is for positions. It just has more numbers. I'll be focusing on the position-only solver case because the algorithms aren't actually different. Side note, gimbal lock is basically when two of these inner rings line up. So when we rotate the inner or outermost ring, we end up manipulating the object in the exact same way. This phenomenon is also why when we create three random numbers for XYZ rotations and use that to get a random point on the surface of a sphere, the point is not uniformly distributed. There are more points towards the poles because of gimbal lock multiplying the error by the transpose. The goal of the Jacobian is to minimize the error, the difference between the goal state and the current effector state. The important thing in this case is we don't actually do any complex calculus here. We'll be operating on each item in this array independent of every other. To multiply the transpose by the error, all we need to do is multiply each component individually and sum them up. That's it. In calculus, this is called a dot product. This is why when we want to account for rotation, in addition to position, it's as simple as adding more numbers into our vector. And that brings us to the most basic Jacobian solver. We've gone over co computing the transpose and multiplying a vector by the transpose. Now that we have those building blocks, the simple solver is just three parts. We get the changes in each angle by getting the dot product of the transpose matrix by the error vector. That is the difference between the grabber position and the goal. Again, we don't actually need to compute the transpose matrix to do this method. Because all the joints are independent, we can get the partial derivatives for just that joint and get the dot product of the end effector with it. So the lower example here is equivalent to the upper example. When you think about it, this method is very strange. There's no way it should work. When we calculate the perturbed effector position minus the effector position, the result is in meters. Then to get the partial derivative, we divide it by the small angle we perturb the joint by. 
so the unit of the derivative is meters over radians. And the error we multiply by is a position minus a position. It's also in meters. So when we multiply them together, the result should be in meters squared over radians. So how does this help us? How can we add this to an angle? Well, the correct solution here is to take the inverse of the Jacobian matrix. Taking the inverse of it will flip the unit. Now it'll cancel out and we'll get an angle out. But we don't have time for that. Inverting a matrix is too slow and it doesn't even always work. And so we use the transpose, which isn't really the right unit and therefore the result isn't really right. Don't think of it as an answer but more guidance. It's a, it's a suggestion for what direction you should probably go. There are cases where it just outputs the wrong direction because the result isn't actually an angle. So the result of the transpose times error is a direction in the joint space where error will probably decrease. Probably. And this is why we multiply the result by a step size. The adjustment we compute isn't actually the right unit, and so it can produce weird results sometimes. Damp least squares time. One of the easier solutions to this is the damp least squares method. It's reasonably performant and fixes our units problem. As before, we'll go through it one bit at a time. Our solver now has this new stuff in it. If lambda is over zero, that means we want to use the DLS method, damp least squares. Ignore the lambda addition for now, what we want to focus on is the units. First we multiply the Jacobian by its transpose. Because we multiply the matrix by itself, and the Jacobian is in terms of meters per radian, the resulting squared matrix is in meters squared per radian squared. Now we take the inverse, so we flip it and now the units are radian squared per meter squared. We multiply the error by the inverse, so the error now has units of radian squared per meter, as the error's meter unit cancelled. Finally, just like in the transpose method, we multiply the error by the transpose. The units now cancel out and the result now has the units right. Computing the Jacobian times the transpose. This step captures the cumulative effects of all joint movements and creates a basis for understanding how their movement will affect the end effector. Where n is the degrees of freedom of the graver and j is the joints, the Jacobian matrix has n rows and j columns while the transpose has j rows and n columns. In matrix multiplication, this means we're multiplying jn by nj and the result will be a jj matrix. So for example, if we're only concerned about position of the effector, the result will be a matrix this 3x3. Three three. And if we want rotation, it will be a 4x4 four four matrix for quaternions or 3x3 three three for Euler angles. And if we want total orientation, it will be a mat 7 or mat 6. Each element of the arrays is sum of sum of products. The simplest code is just these three loops. We can get significant performance improvements by unrolling the loops ourselves. The only thing left is this line, the inverse. For the inverse, we just use a library. I would recommend using GLM or Eigen. Then we want to add the lambda to it before we take the inverse. When we add a number to a matrix like this, this generally means we want to create a diagonal matrix with the values in it and just add them one by one. There's no complexity here, just add the value in one cell to the equivalent cell in the other matrix. The reason we're adding this is to smooth out adjustments, leading to a more gradual change in joint position. Well, what's that mean? When we increase the diagonal dominance of the matrix, that is, make this diagonal part bigger compared to everything else, it makes the matrix less sensitive to small variations and more stable. This is called reducing the condition number in mathy terms. The result is a trade-off between accuracy and stability. Higher lambda values increase stability, meaning they, meaning they reduce oscillation, but this leads to less accurate tracking by the end effector. Conversely, a lower lambda improves accuracy but increases oscillation and overcorrection. So that's all there is to the Jacobian solver. You should have a basic understanding of what the matrix solution is and be able to implement it. I've also included a write-up of the solution in the description for reference, as well as a program for animating full-body IK systems. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments.